Okay, just to reintroduce myself, I'm a freshman attending University of Wisconsin Green Bay from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My major, my name is Javaris Bradford. My major, psychology, my minor is human development. Happy to be here. Uh, once again, my name is Sultan Muhammad. I'm a junior here at University of Green Bay, transferred from um, South Suburban College in Chicago, a uh, basketball player here at the university, uh, human development major, and uh, yeah, just happy to be here. And Darius Johnson, sophomore, transferred from Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, my major is undecided right now, but I'm leaning more towards psych. So, yeah. Um, Hey man, how'd you get up from Jackson, Tennessee? Well, I'm Where'd from you Milwaukee. Oh, you're from Milwaukee? Yeah. How long were you in Jack? I was born and raised in Bristol, Tennessee. That's the only reason why I was asking. You know, you know Lane? You know about Lane? What? Lane in Jackson? No. You don't know about the school? No. I, I grew up, I'm on the west, the south, northeast side of the state. Half oh. the city I lived in was in Virginia. So you're closer to Nashville? No, I'm closer to uh, Knoxville, like north of Knoxville. South of well, I spent uh, summers in Jackson, so that's why I knew. That's how I knew about Lane. Yeah. That's what got me there. That's a black school, Wayne. Yep, okay. HBCU. So, um, your pastor, sir. Yeah. Yeah. You had uh, mentioned when we were kind of really segueing, segueing to like, what's the problem? And you had mentioned uh, the family breakdown, and I just uh, thought that that was, you know, rather interesting because. Just in analyzing the problem, um, I feel like that's a huge part of it. And um, a few people that I've talked to, I've, I've gotten them to understand or rather realize that, um, you know, ever since slavery, there's been an imbalance. If you could just think about, uh, because education is the most important thing in the world, and it starts at home. The classroom is not the only place where education should be taking place in our lives. And for us, a lot of us, that's the case. And so going back to the slavery thing, the reason I brought that up is because if you could just think about when the slaves were first free, emancipated, um, that relationship the slave had with their child, you know, that's how do I father my child and someone owned me for my entire life. That's not something that's fixed over a few days or a few weeks. That's the generational thing that needs to be fixed. And like I said, education is the most important thing, and it starts at home. And so I feel like, you know, obviously that's going to take some time to need fixing. And I feel like it happened in some areas, but if anything that's a setback for us, I feel like that's one of them. You know, and um, I feel like as other people, we kind of um, kind of lost sight of the vision. You know, sure, I'm able to have some of the same opportunities, for the most part anyway, as uh, other people, but... In what way am I taking advantage of those opportunities? I feel like, and like I was telling so time earlier, reading Dr. Martin Luther King's book, he was saying that uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, a lot of African American people were displeased because physically it didn't look like anything was changing. They still had the same income. A lot of African Americans were still being treated unfairly. Everything still looked the same. And he was reasoning by saying that, you know, 10 years ago, no one cared about the plight of the black man and what we were going through. We're getting national attention for this movement. You know, we need to be patient. You know, change isn't always physical. It can be spiritual. It can be mental. And I think that as African Americans, we just kind of lost sight of, and speaking generally, of course, of, of what's important because um, paying too much attention to the physical instead of the mental aspect of what's going on, where the change is coming from. And that goes along with education as well. So I feel like if we can get that back to the forefront and I believe it does start with the family but you got to start young is the thing um, and I feel like this program can at least help move that in the right direction because if you can get young men into a post-secondary institution and get this message out there to them they can carry it you know but it starts with us and you know I feel like my life is uh, kind of sort of more or less just a uh, help people, educate the people. And that's what I want to do. So when the opportunity like this comes along, I'm jumping at it. But I've stopped talking so much, and I'll let them tell you about their experience. <laughs> uh, well, uh, my, my experience uh, with the group, um, you know, one of the things that attracted me um, coming in, like he said, you know, just seeing other students like myself, you know what I mean, having that brotherhood, that camaraderie with, you know, other black males who, you know, we we've never met, but we can sit down and talk and, 
uh, we, we find out we have a lot of the same problems, a lot of the same um, issues that we have to deal with, a lot of the same experiences, um, even growing up, uh, aside from what we experienced here on the university. Um, you know, just being able to, to talk to each other and, uh, you know, when we go into problems, one thing that I like uh, with this group, uh, you know, we don't look at the problem and necessarily try to deal with it uh, on face value. We try to go to the root of the problem, um, you know, understanding cause and effect. Why is this the way it is? Um, an analogy somebody once told me was uh, if you want to kill a plant or kill a weed, you have to expose the root. You know, so I think that, you know, it's, it's very important that, you know, we get to the root of problems and try to to figure out, you know, what's the best way to, to make change in our environment and just to uh, come out with something positive. I think the, our college experience is a microcosm of society altogether, you know, I mean, just the, the things that we deal with and, you know, from the core group that we have, you know, I see a lot of potential. Um, just in the, the, you know, the strong intellectuals that we have that we can come out and, you know, expand from this. You know, you never know. Great things start small, so. Um, coming to the group, um, the only older black males I saw on campus was Sean. And he introduced us to Dr. Coates, who is kind of like a father figure to us all. Um, it was just good to walk in on that Thursday night and see other black men because I came here with Javaris and another one of our friends. Um, we all went to middle school and high school together. So, you know, I thought it was going to be just us three here. But, you know, I came in and I saw other black males, you know, dealing with the same things, you know, one in my class. Because I come from an HBCU, so I'm used to seeing a lot of black males in class, you know, everybody's black at HBCU. You know, I come here and I'm the only black person in the class, and it's like, you know, I don't want to say that I'm less confident, but it just sometimes felt like they kind of had a head up, you know. Um, but when you see other people in the same in the same seat you in, you know, same situation, um, surviving and, and doing well in school, getting good grades, then you know, like it, it's possible. You, you see that it's possible. You know, you see it in motion. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, I can't remember the person. Uh, what's your name again? Javaris. J Javaris? Yes. You said something earlier that, that struck my attention, and, I, and I, it echoes in my mind even now. You said that, you say you're from the Milwaukee area. Yes. And one thing that um, caught you off guard in some regards was they talk differently. And, yeah. that can, and possibly that can make a person feel inferior. Yeah. Now you talk more about that and how did you um, deal with it and, and change or talk to me about that experience. Well, for me, it was a little uh, different because I actually had the opportunity to interact with kids that looked differently to me in high school. There is as well. We were in a program called Youth in Government. It was a mock legislation program and it took place uh, every February and we actually used the state's capital and we like I said, we did mock legislation. And, you know, we were the only African-American kids in the program. And that was intimidating. It's just, it was like, it was scary. You get in there and nobody, and everyone's looking at you. You're a spectacle. And so um, I was very um, conscious. Every step I took, I knew that a lot of these kids had never interacted with an African-American a day in their lives. The only thing they know about me or someone that looks like me is what they see on the news. And that was, yeah, that's not good at all. We know that. And so um, keeping that in mind, I used it as a way, I, I kind of went in head straight. I just, I wanted to show them. It's like they may never get this opportunity again. And I'm blessed with the opportunity to show them something differently. And so kind of having that experience, it helped me being here. And so what I was talking about earlier when I mentioned that is because it came from talking to people, other African-American males, and understanding it from their perspective, you know, because it was less daunting. It was still daunting, you know, being the only, I graduated, our high school, my graduating class is only 22 students. Our school was only 100 or so kids, and I'm in a lecture hall with 100 plus kids, and none of them look like, you know, so that's still an overwhelming thing for a first generation college student. But in talking to kids, that I would, you know, 
trying to get or telling them about UW Green Bay and trying to just really get them interested in college. Guys my age or a few years younger, that's some of the things that you talk about. And from their perspective, it's just like, you know, you may you have your own slang and your own terminology. The job I have here on uh, campus, my boss actually told me, he's, he told me talk better is pretty much what he, and it's like, what? You know, but um, someone had made, a, uh, I guess, a complaint that she didn't understand what I was saying, as articulate or as educated as I'll try to sound. My um, urban accent may jump out, and you know my enunciation may not be as good, um, and whatever you know. So that that's a barrier. It's like I can't even you know in your mind I can't speak as good as you, you know that that can do a lot to you, and that can definitely defer you from a place. We're only gonna go where we think we'll be successful, or we have a chance of doing anything, and you know we all come with stereotypes, unfortunately. But when the stereotype stops you from moving forward, that's a problem. Because a lot of people's stereotypes, they just have ideas about certain groups of people. They don't necessarily stop them from doing their everyday activities. But when your stereotype stops you from, doing, from growing as a person, now that's a problem. And that's what that was, you know. So, yeah, I was just happy to be able to, um, you know, kind of share that perspective or that view because it's real. It's real, and a lot of kids deal with it, so. Yes. Yeah. That was an excellent perspective. I, I like saying me too, you know. I like when I see people in authority. I like seeing um, my, my, my skin tone. I, 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 made a, I made rounds to some, I call them the gatekeepers of the community. Um, YMCA, the Mayor of Green Bay, the Boys and, Club, the Boys and Girls Club, and also the Jim, uh, Green Bay School District. And I asked them, how many of me do you have here in authority? <laughs> And of course, at that moment, I don't know if anything changed. It was last year, I believe. Well, it wasn't last year, the year before last. And there was there was no one in authority that looked like me. And so my, my plight is, and, and honestly, I, I from this standpoint, looking in, looking at the three of you, I'm, I appreciate your your stand as being men and African American men that you are um, able to express yourself the way that you are able to express yourself. Because to me. That image that I see today is needed to be seen out there as well. So, how do we get the image that you are, that you have, that you possess, to see the others can see what you have? Is the Phoenix program geared towards um, community efforts, not only for those who are graduating to high school, but what about the ones in elementary as well? Right. What? What? Because in my mind, I don't know the the the. Um, the statistics of how many African American boys in Green Bay school, public schools, or private schools, or schools of that matter, is is, is graduating, and I, I'm thinking that as a possibility is can we get that positive image out to even younger children? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's a part of the plan or not. I think I think it definitely could become, you know, what I mean, uh, a part of what we want to do. Uh, we we kind of you know in the initial stages right now you know what I mean just getting a strong core together and I think uh, definitely you know you got to lead by example so once we you know we have ourselves solidified us moving out in the community and um, you know gaining momentum uh, like I said you know it's it's no limit to what we can do um, you know with a good foundation so uh, I think we could definitely reach out to younger groups and you know as I I grew up with a father in my home. However, I didn't know what my father did for a living. Uh, however, when I looked out to out my window living in Cabrini Green in Chicago, I saw the only other black people that was in the community were uh, trash men. And I love, honestly, I love the way they rolled those drums. And that was, that was, that was exciting to me. So as I looked out the window and saw that image that was presented to me, I said, when I grow up, I want to roll those drums because that seems so exciting. So when I aged and got a job, guess what job I, I got? A job that rolled <laughs> drums. And so, I, so I, that's why I believe that images um, play an important role in one's life. And if we can get more images out, the, my, my desire is to have billboards with African American people, uh, minorities, saying positive things about us because most of the time what they see, as you stated, um, what's, what's what they see on television, you know, or the, um, the, the, the news reports, uh, to the print that they see. So I, I, I actually I applaud, you know, what the, this organization is doing for, the, for that community. Answers, question to them. Um, <clears throat> I mean, all I can say is that we just need to show them that it's possible. Yeah. I just. You know, yeah. I was gonna say. 
say um that um just in talking to I, I think that it's important to let people know or kids let the kids know that we can relate to them because you have some <coughs> African American males who are you know and think about displacement and it, it's it's truly something that can be a hindrance if you are away from the community for just a few years things can you can come back and feel like you don't know anything and so um being able to relate knowing what it is what's important to you what's important to, you know at 16 to african american man what are the things that are appealing to me that's how you're going to pique my interest and just to let me know like that may be important to you now but you know whatever it is if it's uh girls if it's having money being secure it's like getting us to understand the bigger picture that's the thing and i think that's a way of uh, kind of getting people into the Phoenix Initiative or, you know, becoming interested. And that simply happens through conversation, um, word of mouth or, you know, seminars and things like that, letting them know, really walking up to them and what's your name, you know, getting to know them, seeing what their interests are and letting them know, yeah, I remember that being my interest at one point, but what about five years from now? You think that's what you're still going to be interested in? Or if it still is, you'd probably be a lot better suited at pursuing that interest if you had these credentials or if you were in this position in life you know that's really and you know granted I'm, I'm young and maybe I don't know what I'm talking about you know but uh, I think that that's a way to really make it happen you just gotta let them know I know where you come from I know some of the things you've faced some of the things that you're up against I know what's in what may or may not be important to you and so if you can just really put a little faith in me you know I'm here I'm still going but you can do it too, because at the end of the day, if you're comfortable, and see the thing is too, because I'm talking to him about that again, the culture of poverty, sometimes we're okay with our circumstances because we have never seen anything different. So we think it's normal. If it's normal to struggle or just our frame of thinking, we think that it's normal. But if you go somewhere else, and that's another thing, I feel like it's important for us as young people to travel to go somewhere else, because in Milwaukee, a lot of kids have never been outside of their community, so they think that that's the world. I mean, downtown, for crying out loud, the lakefront. They've never been to places like these, so they don't know what it's like in different parts of the world and how people do things differently. So your frame of thinking never changes because you're not exposed to anything different. So once you expose us to new, di new things, you can get us interested into different things. We're, cu we're all curious. We're human, be human beings are curious. So, but you, you know, you pose a question to them, something as simple as, you know, why is it a liquor store on every other corner in my neighborhood, but then I go to a suburban or rural area and it's not that way? You know, just, just something like that. It's like, now nah, I got you. You know, and I can use that to segue into something that's more important, the bigger picture. You know, and I feel like things like that happen, of course, through time, but through simple conversation. You know. uh, to, to harp on his point, um, Mr. Man, um, I... I uh, you know, I often hear that uh, people say, you know, the black man is an endangered species and not saying that black males. I mean, obviously, there's plenty of black males. I'm talking about black men, you know, who, who are working or in school or, you know, have something going on producing, um, you know, not incarcerated or, you know, dealing with a lot of the problems that we have. And I think, um, you know, like like you said, us going out into community and community and just having like young children, or high school students, or other college students be able to see our face and see that you know, we can do right, you know what I mean? We can we can do positive things, um, you know what I mean? I think that alone will spark momentum, um, you know what I mean? And a point uh, someone else had made uh, about, you know, Barack Obama being in the White House, you know, you can argue about whether he's doing a good job or not, but just the fact that a black man is in a high position, um, you know what I mean? And someone that children can look up to, that alone, is positive for our community. So, you know, just our face being out and seeing that we can do something, I think that will be appealing. Yes. I'm to say something. Have you guys had a chance to get out to any high schools? And how's that interaction been? Um, not uh, not yet. It's the ongoing process. I'm, I'm so ready. <laughs> I'm so ready because I feel like the sooner, the better. And yeah, the sooner the better. But not yet, but that's pretty much the next thing on the agenda. You said you went to high school in Milwaukee? Yes. Okay. Uh, how did, I guess, how did your, 
How did your classmates take it when you came all the way up here to go to school? I mean, um, the ones that knew, <laughs> you know, uh, the thing about Nova, Nova was considered a school for at-risk youth um, with some exceptions. I was an exception. Darius was an exception. And I'm not Frank Kenyatta, exceptions. None of us were considered at risk of not graduating school on time. But that's the type of kids that were at the school simply because they were held back, they were kicked out of a school or something like that. With that being said, Nova, we've been given so many opportunities that it's, it's I mean, I could go on and on. I was an um, intern for uh, Senator West Feingold at one point. Um, that program I was telling you about that got me introduced to being outside of my own race. A whole lot of opportunities just from the school alone. But um, it's funny because I go back now or when we go back for break and I'm always up there as much as possible. And I want them to talk to me and approach me. And a lot of them just have questions. They're like, w what is it like up there? And they had, I heard it was boring. And, you know, and so just having those conversations with them is like, well, what's your definition of boring? Um, or... Or I heard it's all it's all white people up there. You you hear that, and it's like, well that's true. But if you came, it'd be one more you. <laughs> you know, just well, show me. I think that uh, I'm a big I'm a firm believer in like just setting goals and make the goals happen for yourself and leave some of the I call it noise behind because at the end of the day, you know you have to make it happen for yourself. You can't depend on anybody else to to further your plot in life. Um, I mean, uh, I'm, just a, I'm just a firm believer in doing that. And then sitting down with these kids and pretty much asking them, like, what do you want to do? I mean, what's your, what's your goal? Do you have any goals? Do you set any goals for yourself? I mean, like, pretty much just speaking to the point you were saying before, you know, I know you're 15, 16 years old, but what do you want to be in five years from now? Like, what, what are your, what are your, your short-term goals, long-term goals? Because at the end of the day, you got to have a plan and you got to work towards it. Um, I mean, it might be crass and hard, but that's just, that's the reality of the situation. I mean, I don't know. I just think that people that do do the right thing get too much credit just because if, if you're raising your kids, if you have kids and you raise that's your, your job, kids, you should, right. yeah, you yeah, should that's be no reward for, for that. that. I mean, yeah. I mean, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, pat on the shoulder. It shouldn't be, uh, um, it shouldn't be an a, 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 incentive. No, it, it shouldn't be. You shouldn't have to. You feel like that by you doing the right thing, you should be held up to a standard or something like that. No, I mean, I mean, I got two kids, a wife, and never once did I ever think about you know. Well, I mean, it, it's a learning process, but I didn't think about you know. Yeah, there's other other things I could be doing, but at the end of the day. You know, I got two kids to take out. I mean, I got a wife and kid to take care of. I got a mortgage. I got all this. I got all these responsibilities to take care of. Um, but that's just my that's my long term goal: get these kids in college and do whatever I can with this to grow, grow the bigger picture, grow old with my wife. Like, it sounds corny, but I mean, that's that's the pursuit of life. Yeah. But uh, just with this, with this, with this initiative, though. You gotta ask them what their goals are and give them common sense things. It'll feel better coming from guys like y'all than 35 plus year old men like you know me or 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 pastor, 35 year old pastor. But uh, it, it's gonna be it's gonna have more impact coming from you guys than coming from somebody like me because I can't. I mean I can relate, but I can't really relate to a 15 or 16 year old boy yes. or female. Yes. And one of the things that I just try to get people to uh, understand too, just being fortunate enough to have certain conversations with people, is just letting them know that, uh, you know, every dec the decisions that we make, they're made based on the examples that we have around us, you know, so the decision. Where are my, my goals, to answer your question too, uh, or your statement, my goals can be uh, functioned around the things I have as examples in front of me. So nobody, the thought of college never occurred to me or never was appealing, appealing to me because not only did my dad not even graduate high school, my mom didn't, my cousin didn't, you know, or I have a cousin who may be into some illegal activities. And that's enticing, unfortunately, because he has money in his pocket. He's seen somewhat, because at the end of the day, all we really want to do is make it. That's what we're trying to do. 
No one. We didn't just wake up one day. <laughs> I'm going to hurt the community because I don't care. You know, it's not that it's very few people out there that really want to do harm. Their, their intentions are to hurt people. At the end of the day, all we ever wanted to do was have a better life. But it's like the choices that presented in front of us, the most immediate choice anyway, and like I said, that's an enticing lifestyle at that point. You got money in your pocket. You seem somewhat stable. Rather, if it is fast money, that's not even a debate because we understand that fast money has no value. But you have money in your pocket. You have nice clothes and all of these physical things to us that uh, stimulate us because we never had them. And I guess for whatever reason, we feel a sense of power or completeness because we have these things, and it really just comes from not having them. You know, you, you have, um, you get attention from, from, from women. It's like all of those things contribute to that lifestyle being enticing, to us making the decision to go that route versus my life is not what I think it should be right now, or I'm not comfortable with my circumstance. I'm not comfortable with struggling. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to college because if I educate myself, I can provide a better life for myself and maybe even my fam my community. You know, uh, the the... The road you travel down to make those decisions, there's so much that go that goes into those decisions. Um, and yeah, just taking that social work class is really eye-opening because when I hear about problems now, I instantly think about the root of the problem or the cause of it. And then I think about the help or the, the funding. Unfortunately, we live in a world where you can control the way people think based on the money you make, unfortunately. But then I think about the help being put towards fixing that issue. And the problem's always here, and then the issue or the help being put towards it is always, you know, a few stories down. That's a problem within itself. And, you know, I feel like just putting it on us, not anyone else, or people who have the, the means or just the time, because the time is more important than the money to make a difference. We should just do all that we can first, you know, and then outsource. I just think that that makes most sense um, just for us to do everything that we can and then try to seek help from other places. But yeah, I just wanted to sort of a, a rebuttal or, uh, to your question statement. Yeah, I wanted to say something. Uh, something you were talking about earlier with the exposure and all and your experience of being around, you know, you're the minority in the classroom with the whites. And me coming from, well, I was born in Mississippi. Moved here from Illinois, you know, remember those who moved here from Illinois. And of course, this is a whole different world than, you know, like you say, you've been around all, you know, African Americans and all. And then to come here was quite different. This is, you know, it could be, you know, culture shock, you know, coming from a place like Mississippi with all African, you know, a bunch of African Americans. And uh, what I did, I began to learn from my surroundings. I'm around a whole different culture, basically white people, you know where I was around lots of blacks. And so what I began to discover was a lot of things that we, being only being around ourselves, there is a certain image that you get because it's all you're around. And if you branch out, begin to be around others, you, begin, you can relate to things that are quite similar. I've seen a lot of similar things that we deal with that they're dealing with in their community mm -hmm. that I never even knew. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in the public, I had owned a business for seven years here, so it was a, a lot of people I was involved with in the public coming in and out of stores, and I saw so many similarities that we dealt with and different mindsets. And I began to see that it was not as big of a difference as I thought to a degree, you know, as far as, you know, human, you know, nature, whatever. And uh, I also realized that a lot of the big, main, one of the main issues was a communication thing. You know, me speaking to them was just as foreign. Foreign. What they were trying to, you know, understanding me was difficult. You know, we have a church where we had different multicultural, different races in our church, and us trying to communicate. Sometimes we were saying things. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I think we face that, like especially you being in a college where it's, you know, more whites. They could be, you know, trying to reach you and where you are in the communication. That's their world. They understand that, but they don't understand exactly where you are. That can be a big issue too. But we do have to learn to adjust because that's our environment. There's nothing wrong with that. You like, you know, sometimes we may think, I don't want this, I want you to change me because it's not really changing, it's learning and I think it's empowering and then and expanding your mind to more and then you can take that back to uh, the community or blacks and then teach them that. And don't be afraid. Sometimes like we're afraid of, of I, I say, I guess, becoming less black in a sense. <laughs> you know, it's true. And it's not really becoming less black. You just, you know, gaining knowledge, really. 
and, and I think about even from long ago, a lot of the mindset came from long ago when you had the slave owners and the way they thought, they not only put it in their white children's mind, it was in the slaves' mind too, constantly. And the N word was said so much so to blacks called N, like there was a friendly name back then. It was said so much. So that was in the mind. You know, and it was in their and it was in their children's mind. They taught it. Some some kids escaped it, and so that's the same thing we have to do. We have to, our minds. We have to. We it's, it's some years of healing that has to be done. It's a lot of work, and and I think a lot of teaching has to be done at homes. So we have to start little, at you know, teaching those children children while they're little, and letting develop that mindset that you are somebody that uh, you know this. You know, just a lot of stuff. The positive things about. Who you are has to be put in at an early age because as you grow up, you are intimidated. Uh, uh, kids now, a lot of them are not as bad. It depends on what how they grew up yeah. and their parents and what things they put in their minds at home. You know, they that that's no issue for them. But a lot of that's that's from way back, and it's a mindset. It is definitely a mindset. And kids are intimidated about it. They don't want to come to school and surrounded by it. They feel uncomfortable. But anybody, if you had a white person put in an environment with full of blacks like that, they're gonna feel uncomfortable too. It's, more, it's like natural, you know, so it's not like odd ah, that you will feel that way, but uh, I think the challenge, to take the challenge it was, is awesome and, and, and go for it and you can help some others come out of that. I think that would be awesome. I don't see it's a bad thing. Yeah. It would be good, you know, because, yeah. you know, especially I think too, us, a lot of our background, we grew up with music and sports. That's what a lot of times you think about with blacks, music and sports. Nothing wrong with that. It's in our blood. We got to support the rhythm, singing. It's no bad. But everybody doesn't have it. And so they don't know what options to turn to sometimes because this is what I'm around. What else can I be? You know, I know we got music here. We got, we got uh, sports. What else can I do? And to be exposed to even other races that have other career, careers like that may give an interest, you know, give some more sparks of interest in other things that they can do. Some don't want to go to college. They don't know what they want to do. I'm just going just because you said, I don't have an interest in anything else out there. I can't sing, I can't dance, what do I do? I can't play sports. And I think exposing to other career options is nice. And you may have to get around other races because you may not see it around amongst us. Right. And it's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I appreciate that, I really do. Because you're right, you're right. And sometimes it's what it takes to adjust. But, um, you signaling to wrap up. Uh, I think we only have a few minutes left, but just to reiterate, you know, next thing on our agenda, yeah, it's really recruitment. So I'd be more than happy. Um, and we have meetings too, so these things will be discussed. But getting into some of these high schools and talking to the kids or whatever we need to do, really, to just get them here to hear the message. Because I feel like if I we can get the message out there, if I can get your ear, then. I got you, you know, make, we can make a difference that way, so. I just wanted to, uh, <clears throat> to ask, do you all have an idea of where you're going to have your next meeting or like in the future, are you going to have your meetings steer towards like the inner city of Green Bay, like downtown? Because I think that'll be a target to get most or a lot more attendees at your meetings. Okay. Because I tried to get, I have, I'm, I'm actually a mother of two young men. And um, they're both 18, one 18 and one 20 year old. And um, I struggled as a single mom with raising them. And they didn't have their father around. And my goal for them was to get them graduated out of high school, which I accomplished. I accomplished them, you know, they're both here in, the, here in this area. You know, so I mean, I, it's a huge accomplishment for them as well as for myself. Because when they walked across the stage, I was like, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, <laughs> you know. And um, I mean, so it was a struggle, you know, raising those young men. And even now, my, my oldest son, he's, he's done a year in college. But now he's struggling because he stopped. He's, he doesn't have that motivation to right. move forward. And with me being a single mom, my goal was just to get him out of high school. And now here I am saying, you know, if my goal had been back then right. to, you know, set that goal for them to get through college, maybe I would have pushed them a little more. And so I think you all would be an encouragement for them to even be leaders, you know, because they made it to that point to even finish high school. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I mean, even to pull them, it would be great because my oldest son, I wanted him to be here tonight. And he's like, college, what college, mom? You know, because it was so far and, you know, just kind of those excuses. Sorry. And I think if you all were probably in the inner city more closer, 
it probably could, you know, have an effect not only for my son, but for more, you know, black men in the community, so. Definitely take that into consideration, yeah. definitely. Yeah, that was well, one thing that, uh, on the PowerPoint presentation, is to try to do some of these uh, black male symposiums or uh, meetings at local high schools to get more parents involved. And, you know, the parents and the, the, the children can come to the schools, but unfortunately, it's been a lot of, uh, Politics, uh, not able to uh, get around. So, but, um, maybe went to the prayer. our meetings are open, right, Sean? To whoever wants to come, right? Or the next meeting you were saying? Were you? Did you say that that our next meeting? Or it's up to you guys. It's okay. Group. Well, yeah. Um, in, invite you guys. Um, whoever wants to. It's it's for males, but if you want to come just to observe, to have a takeaway, to to give back, or you know something to talk about. We're more than happy to have you just for you guys to see what we're doing and what we're talking about. I look forward to Thursday, six o'clock. You know, it's it's an, it's an important time. So I invite you all to come and check out a meeting, um, to be a part of it, to help in whatever way you can. Time is the most important thing that, that we have we all have to offer. So yeah. Nineteen sixty five room? Yes. Um the, our meeting room, our regular meeting room, is um, Heritage, the, room. Heritage Room. It's right upstairs. Uh, as soon as you walk in the union, of course, it's a way to, uh, you can be directed there, but um, as soon as you walk in the union, it's um, right across from uh, the, the 1965 room. So, yeah. That'd be all. Am I missing something? Are you missing anything? Thank you oh, for coming. Wait, wait, did everybody get that? Uh, is it the Heritage Room? Yeah. Yes. In a union? Yes, yeah, so every Thursday, 6. It's from 6 to 8. You don't have to stay the whole time. You can come and go as you please. Sometimes we leave, you know, we're college students. We have homework and things of that nature. So sometimes we're not able to stay for the whole two hours. But from 6 to 8, love for you all to meet Dr. Coates, too. <laughs> yeah. Walking piece of history. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. The, only, the, only, uh, the only black uh, tenure professor male on campus in the last 15 years Three to five, no, uh, five to eight, five to eight, no, five to six, 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 six to eight, six to eight, six to eight. Say, yeah, my <laughs> yeah. All right, any more questions before we wrapped up? I know, sir, just walked in. You wanted to contribute anything? Uh, no, I'm okay. Okay, yeah, thank everybody for coming. Um, you know, I think even though as small as this meeting is, it's a start, it's a it's start. momentum, and uh, right. You know, the potential is limitless. And, uh, you know, like uh, the point she brought up, um, you know, it's a process of remaking the mind of our black youth, you know what I mean? And uh, people can talk about how far slavery is from us, but it's it's really not, you know, and the, and the, and the mind and the mentality, you know, is definitely still present today. You know, it's clear cut uh, evident that, you know, we haven't escaped that mentality. and. Uh, you know, we have the right target. We got the right people. Um, we start, we have growing support. So uh, just, you know, I ask that everybody that's here, you know, stick with us and uh, I think we can do something special in this city. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good.